I hate to do this, but I need some darkness. I really hate to say that. Ivan, could you... Uh, it's over here. Look, I'll go straight into my, into my talk. Last year, I discussed the basic principles of, of social technology theory, which is a, a, a theory with which I've been working um, for the last 10 years. And it, it's, it's a fancy title, social technology theory, but the idea is very simple. It began as a reply to the social constructionists who challenged um, human ethologists in this way. They said, look, if, as you say, there are human instincts, if in fact there is an innate repertoire of human behaviours, then how can you explain the great diversity of cultures, includes, including political culture? How can you explain the great diversity of, of uh, political forms? Some societies hierarchical, others egalitarian. Some so societies with clear caste divisions or gender divisions, and others not. And this is the same, in essence, the same challenge that's been thrown at Pierre Vandenberg when he talks on the one hand about innate predispositions, um, but then naturally wants to talk about the, uh, human flexible strategizing and, and, and what is made of that. So the social technological answer is um, actually a fancy name for the Lorenz Ivalibusfeldt line of analysis in ethology, which treats behaviors as tools which all mammals can manipulate in a simple way in social play. This is one of Ivel's earliest discoveries, but which uh, humans have taken to a much higher level and where we manipulate, invent, and learn and play with ways of manipulating our fellow human beings and ourselves. You know, for example, hierarchy is a most unnatural thing. Um, and it's a human, uh, a human creation. So let me run through some of the assumptions quickly, because I discussed this last year, and I'm sure it's fresh in your, in your minds, most of your minds. In the, on the historical time scale, this innate repertoire, instincts, if you want to call it, don't change. In, 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 in a, when we look close up at uh, the world in units of tens of years or hundreds of years, human nature is essentially unchanging. Furthermore, human nature has a degree of modularity, just as the badger, which uh, Ivor Lavisfeld uh, observed when he was a young student, just as the badger can decouple its, its um, instinctively expressed behaviours, anger, approach and withdrawal and so on, um, it can decouple that from their functions, from their full-blown functions of attack, <coughs> for example, and resequence them in a, in, a, in a creative play sequence. So the human repertoire is modular. And I'm not referring to brain modules now, I'm referring to, to behavioural modules, where, we, where, for example, if I wanted to, uh, I could jump up on the table and do a strip tease, if I wanted, um, and then act like a serious professor, M maybe that would be more difficult, and then, and so on. So I could, I could sequence it as I decide with my neocortex to, to do so. And humans' tool-making intelligence allows, them to, allows us to discover and invent and to learn, to, to receive from previous generations um, these techniques for, techniques for, uh, um, for manipulating our behaviour and other people's behaviour. Though that means that we can have traditions developing. And I'll, we'll be looking at, soon I'll be looking at a, a, a chart of some key social technologies as they emerged over the preceding 12,000 years. Thus human, thus human nature, the repertoire of evolved behaviours, offers building blocks for complex social forms, including the state. The idea is that hierarchy, this, this most unnatural thing of extended uh, bureaucracy rather, with its, with its unnatural robot-like obedience and, uh, and, and 
<laughs> command, blunt commands being given. Most unnatural hunter-gatherers rarely give blunt commands, for example. This is not, not, not how, we, how we evolve, but it's being constructed. And when you look at it in detail, there's nothing new about it. There's nothing new about hierarchy. There's nothing actually new at the micro level about the state, even the state. It's constructed from quite familiar uh, behaviours. I then argue that... Oh, how is that? I then adopted a, a very Vandenbergish approach to breaking down to categorising or creating a typology of these social technologies. And I think they can be distributed along three axes, dominance, reciprocity, and affiliation. Um, Pierre talks about, about nep nepotism or kin selection, which is clearly a form of, of, of affiliation. But I, I use a, a, broader, a broader concept. So it's a, basically, it's, it's the same uh, three-way axis, I think. Uh, Pierre talks about coercion. I refer to dominance. I think there's a more ecological term, but essentially the idea is the idea is the same. And I think one can arrange modern organisations and old traditional organisations in this three-dimensional space. By the way, despite what I said yesterday, Pierre, notice that schools are very close to prisons. I, I have to confess, um, I don't have factories in there. All right. And now, this is not for you to study up close, but just the overall idea is that one can take these three um, uh, behavioural systems, these three independent systems, and try to figure out, this is just a, a, an a, initial attempt at modelling how they work to construct bureaucracies, for example. Okay, so the feedback mechanisms and dominance, for example, can be used in, in uh, cunning ways to... to to construct, to increase affiliation or decrease affiliation within, within societies, as can re reciprocity. So, we live in an era of growing importance of, of market systems, which is which is based on, on reciprocity. But that that's not core to my core. And so, in the social technology, in social technology theory, we had from the Neolithic revolutions and before. If you go from band, then 12,000, 10,000 years ago, the tribe, chieftains, traditional state, and then the um, post-industrial state, we've had emerging social technologies. And this is based on, um, on a, a classic paper by Flannery, 1972, and I've added some other social technology from an ethological perspective that he didn't have. My, oh, his original table is in capitals, and I've added some extra, some extra things. But we'll see, you know, band societies were egalitarian. They used ad hoc ritual. Um, leadership was, leadership was uh, often by expertise. Either gender could lead. Um, and then, you, beginning with the Neolithic Revolution, we had the emergence of calendric ritual and uh, ritual rehearsal of dominance of su and submission um, into the picture. Then we had prescribed, <coughs> prescribed uh, rank and so on and so forth. So this is the broad overview of social technology, of the social technology idea. And it brings me to the theme uh, that I want to discuss today, which is, and what I want to do is take up the theme raised by Valerie Tishkoff, Professor Tishkoff, on our, uh, on our first day. And he was discussing uh, ethnic conflict, uh, its emergence, its causes, and possible means of, of preventing or curing or ameliorating it. And um, I've set myself the same problem, um, and this is, many people ask this, they think, well, how can we avoid Bosnias? How can we avoid um, Rwandas, how can we avoid genocides and nationalistic wars? These are all ethnic phenomena, on the, very much on the negative side. But the difference is, I, I, my idea is to approach it explicitly from a social technological perspective, from an ethological perspective, 
and at least talk about what might be done um, and doing so from an evolutionary perspective. Now, let me say at the outset, I don't have any answers. Okay? These, I'll just be throwing out some ideas and I hope we'll have, a, have time for, for discussion after this. So these are just ideas and I'll try to, to distinguish as I go through between well-researched premises and, and where I've simply thrown up a speculation. If I fail to do that, I'm sure someone will point it out to me. Okay, so I'll sit, I'll sit to read this now. The modern social world is comprised of populations and social processes, many orders of magnitude larger than those in which we evolved. Instead of living in, in intimate groups of perhaps 30 people, embedded in a dialect population of perhaps 500, most of us now live in, in million-sized, anonymous, stratified societies. That's not natural. The formulation of workable social technologies relies on predictive theories of human nature. Now that, that follows. If, you, if we can't make any predictions about, about uh, the nature of behaviour tomorrow, then we can't work out predictive... Um, we can't work out uh, uh, methods for dealing with ethnic conflict, conflict or any other problem that will work tomorrow. So we need predictive theory, and this, of course, is a nightmare in the social sciences. But predictability, when you think about it, requires the identification of some kinds of universals, something that will be the same tomorrow as it is today. And it's a task, I think, for which ethology, or evolutionary biology more broadly, um, evolutionary psychology and so on, that are well equipped. Only social technologies um, and the reason they're, they're well equipped is that they're dealing with biological processes. They're dealing with these relatively fixed, um, innate behaviours that, that, that repeat themselves each generation, at least to some extent. <coughs> Another point I'd make is that only, only social technologies such as institutions can solve some of these large macro problems that we're faced with in, in the modern world, such as ethnic conflict. All right, so let's just, let's just set up, set the problem. The problem is, is war, one can sum it up. The, the problem is large loss of life and property, especially over the last hundred years. I think yesterday um, Pierre graphically described some of the costs. Not, not, it's not just the cost of, of having a state, but it's also the nation state, because... You know, um, Nationalism, in its various forms, is an important mobilising instrument or technique for bringing people together, making them, to some extent, um, voluntarily subordinate themselves to a group cause and then, tur then turning that solidarity against outside groups. The state has been described as an instrument for fighting wars. That's Van, Van Crevel's idea, that, and I think that is plausible, at least in the, for the 19th century state. And that's, that was true even before the rise of modern nationalism, beginning in the early 19th century. Now let's look at some ideas. Um, a new, this, as I said, this is not a new topic. So I'm going to put up, um, if I can find it, an overhead of existing ideas, some, some existing ideas, for ameliorating ethnic conflict. Is that, uh, is that legible? Probably not. Mm -hmm. to the One um, well well proven technique, both experimentally mm -hmm. and and at the political level. Is there a problem? We're going to focus it. Oh. Yeah. So we went? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, I guess it's a 
Say when. Sharif's uh, classic studies in the 1950s and 1960s, these were psychological experiments, indicated that an overarching challenge, some superordinate goal, for example, some outside threat, um, can unite individuals who were previously uh, in conflict. Applications of this principle include um, alliances between nations against third nations, so, for example, in World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union found themselves allies uh, against the Axis powers. And yet, um, 20 years earlier, 20 years earlier, the United States was sending soldiers to fight against the Bolshevik regime. Um, and also, multi-ethnic societies um, can unite against a common enemy or against a shared challenge, such as a, a natural disaster can bring people together. And the most, a recent example is the attack on New York in September last year. Um, numerous commentators noted the, the rising sense of solidarity among Americans of all classes and uh, ethnic and racial groups. Another way, another superordinate goal, less, perhaps less uh, uh, emotional in its impact is trade. So if people, if people um, um, can gain materially by cooperating, even though they have some <coughs> resentment and some historical problems with each other, um, they, can, they can be brought together in a sense of mutual, uh, a mutual project. A more modern idea um, is the idea of the concept nation. Knowledge that, that people can bond to symbols such as flags and slogans underlies the support of the concept nation. When the, when the concepts representing a nation are abstract principles, for example, if, if, if the French decide that, that to be French is to support democracy or, demo or support civil rights and so on. These are abstract concepts that can bond people from all sorts of backgrounds. All you have to do is, in principle, all you have to do is uh, accept those, those, uh, those principles and you belong to the nation. And this is, the, this is a, a modern trend um, that many argue the, the EU should follow, for example. One possible advantage is that um, is that because a nation is not perceived ethnically in this, uh, but in this sense, but ideologically, according to a set of principles, then changes in ethnic proportions within the, within the society due to immigration or differential birth rates will not arouse a negative reaction from groups that are, are shrinking in relative terms. Because this is one um, one probable cause of endemic ethnic conflict when you have shifting ethnic proportions such that it's visible generation to generation and the shrinking group uh, often feels threatened and, um, and one can have polarisation and, and so on. But if the concept of the society is an embracing set of principles, then the shrinking group can be relaxed and, and feel, well, you know, it doesn't matter because what matters is democracy and individual rights or whatever. Now a version of this um, of the concept nation is the cultural nation. It was a very closely connected idea. This is based on an intuitive notion of ethnic group markers. Uh, the people who are the theoreticians who've been promoting this, um, it's as if they've read Vandenberg, Shaw and Wong, and Boyd and Richardson. It's as if they know that that. Uh, um, you know, well, Shaw and Wong, for example, this um, religion, language, um, uh, culture in general, as well as, as phenotypic appearance and knowledge of kinship as, as, um, uh, as kin markers. And those three cultural base ones can be manipulated. If people share a territory, for example, or in principle, this is a, 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 an indirect kinship marker that might very well trigger solidarity among them, even though they're genetic competitors. So this might be a way of, of, of combining them. 
Um, an example is the Americanization movement, for example, of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Immigrants were encouraged to adopt the local American language and style of dress and sometimes even uh, uh, religious forms um, as a means of avoiding an ethnocentric response from the native born. In other words, to become an American, you speak like an American and you, you think like an American and you support the Constitution and you know, um, uh, it, it was felt this would create a melting pot and result in a reunified nation. The strategy is generally effective, it seems to me, if it can be made to work, if, if it can be, can be got going. Though some questions uh, remain concerning racial group markers. So what's happened in America is that, yes, you've had a melting pot to a certain extent, but within racial groups. So there's a generic white group, there's a generic uh, African uh, group and generic, generic Asian group, with different rates of intermarriage between, it's true. But um, this is what the ethnic studies indicate, that at this stage, the coalescence has occurred within racial groups. But basically, the principle seems to, seems to be effective. Again, defining the nation culturally helps diffuse concern about changes in ethnic proportions. Makes them invisible, really, in principle. Um, another idea, again, which Pierre discussed, uh, is panmixia. If two ethnic groups in conflict intermarry to such an extent that, uh, that uh, I have as many relatives on the other side as I do on my own, um, conflict generally evaporates. Um, Friedman, Dan Friedman, actually argued this explicitly in 1979 in his book Human Social Biology, where um, he argued for panmixia on a, on a global scale. And I think he actually began practicing it at that stage, Dan. And um, Pierre Vandenberg has also noted that, that, uh, that uh, you know, high rates of, of intermarriage will generally diffuse conflict. Another idea that uh, I might refer to Pierre again is, is uh, the, the is use of coercion. Pierre would say coercion. Observation of dominance in everyday life led Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century to advocate power for government to solve problems of internal conflict, civil war. Um, he said it could only be solved by a powerful state that crushed uh, uh, conflict, that prevented it. And the Hobbesian approach is, is adopted by, med by many modern governments, from Malaysia to France, and these, these governments actually suppress forms of overt racial discrimination and, and to, to the point of speech acts that, that run against the official, uh, official ideology of whatever it might be, multiculturalism or... In Malaysia, some of these sanctions can be quite severe. Another approach is to um, is to uh, emphasise individual interests, individual rights, to focus on the individual rather than on groups. This is an institutional approach. Um, observations of the reactive character of ethnocentrism, especially to discrimination and threats to the group, um, led Pierre, for example, in a forthcoming paper. Um, to recommend in individualism, where, for example, in the case of the United States, instead of handing out um, uh, welfare and other uh, perks on the basis of ethnic or racial group membership, it would be done strictly on an individual basis. This would tend to de-emphasize um, uh, the existence of groups and their conflicting interests and it would instead um, focus on the, on the individual. <clears throat> now these strategies aim at reducing conflict. Now, the, all these strategies are focused on one thing, reducing conflict. They don't have any other goals. It's a pretty important goal. I mean, one of the, the horrors from which um, civilization has freed us, and Henry Harpending made this point in his talk, is um, endemic internal strife. Uh, clan conflict, uh, a raid here where one or two people are killed, and so on, which, which um, is much worse 
than the uh, resulting in death rates much worse than the worst um, 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 cities in the West. And this has been a great blessing. So, so avoiding conflict is very important, but of course it's not everything. National solid... One thing that seems to me that all these techniques share is that they tend to suppress or undermine or diffuse ethnic solidarity, which in the modern world often amounts to national solidarity. And obviously this is one way to undermine <coughs> national conflict. If it, taken to the extreme, if the nation itself can be abolished, well, by definition, there can be no more national conflict because the nation doesn't exist anymore. Or at least if the nation can be abolished as a psychological construct or as an emotional, uh, a compelling object of loyalty, then this will make it very difficult for politicians to mobilise people in, in bloody wars and genocides. It makes sense. But again, the, the casualty is national solidarity, and including ethnic, ethnic solidarity. So does that matter? Well, I think it does. And now I'll go through some recent research and connected ideas which indicate that there are real benefits um, in, with, of real benefits coming from national solidarity, including, by that I also mean homogeneity. So I don't necessarily mean flag-waving uh, parades and so on. I mean the, the, the quiet, organic solidarity that can simply come from, from homogeneity. Easterly and Levine in the United States found that ethnic diversity is a major predictor of low public investment in such public goods as schooling and infrastructure, with resulting depressed economic growth. They found that the African, the incredibly high levels of African diversity, where sometimes you'll have 20 ethnic groups and partial ethnic groups, tribes, in the one state, um, had, accounts for something like, you know, from memory, 40% of the difference in the growth rates between Africa and, uh, and East Asia. In a global survey, Sanderson, by the way, who was meant to be here presenting this, this research next lecture, but who, who, who could not come, um, Sanderson found that ethno-racial heterogeneity, in other words diversity, strongly lowers welfare expenditure. Now, if one considers welfare expenditure to be a positive value, then that, that is a cost. That is a cost. If, if you think that welfare is intrinsically bad, then that's another benefit of destroying national solidarity. Um, and, you know, he, he found that it was of equivalent weight to other independent variables, such as gross national product, labour organisation, you know, the strength of trade unions, and level of democracy. These are well-known and accepted powerful predictors of a, of a robust welfare state. Well, ethnic diversity is a negative predictor of equal status. Then comes um, stronger public goods. Some of these overlap. Within the United States, Alicina and colleagues recently found that the more ethnically or racially diverse cities, they studied 40 cities across the United States, they found that as diversity increased, um, spending on public goods declined. So less was spent, was spent as a proportion of the budget um, on, on um, public goods such as garbage collecting, collection, public libraries, these sorts of local uh, public goods. These results parallel the findings made by other, theory, other uh, social scientists that at the state level in the United States per capita expenditure on Medicaid generally, generally declines as racial diversity increases. So again, if one considers these positive, uh, uh, positive assets, then um, there's a cost to breaking down solidarity. For reasons unexplained, ethnic diversity decreases foreign aid. So diverse societies, there are about something like 26 countries that give foreign aid in the world. And robustly, there's an inverse proportion between diver level of diversity, ethnic diversity, and the amount of foreign aid given. One measure of ethnic diversity indeed accounts for 80% of the variance between countries in foreign aid expenditure, controlling for gross national product.
relatively ethnically homogeneous countries tend to be wealthier, simply wealthier. This is Alicina again at, at, at Harvard. A movement from complete heterogeneity to complete homogeneity is associated with an incoming increase of 3.8 times, 380%, according to Easterly and Levine. Ethnic diversity may contribute to socio-economic inequality. The best studied society in this regard, again, is the United States. Borjas, uh, last year, published a major finding that immigration to the United States has caused about one-third of the inequality that existed in, by the mid-1990s. Again, if one likes, you know, a lot of this is value-based, if one likes an inequality, having very poor and very wealthy people, then lack of ethnic homogeneity or ethnic solidarity is good. But if you don't like inequality, then, then it's bad. Now we come to probably the most important um, and visible evidence of loss of social cohesion, which is violent conflict. And I've already touched on this. Uh, Rummel from the University of, Ho of Hawaii is considered the, the uh, world leader in this field. In his cross-cultural study of pluralism and collective violence across 162 states between 1932 and 1982, so in the middle of, of the last century, he took 50 years in the middle and, and, and compared 162 states, and he found that the degree of ethnic diversity within a society is related to the incidence of ethnic violence. Rummel concludes thus, quote, the more ethnic groups in a state, so the more you know, six or ten, whatever, the more, ethnic, more number, higher the number of ethnic groups in a state, the more likely it will have a high rate of guerrilla and revolutionary warfare. And the more religious groups in a society, the more intense that general violence. So violence per se, the incidence rate per se, goes up, uh, is correlated with a number of ethnic groups. The intensity of those incidents is magnified by when, when religion enters, enters the picture. Um, this is largely moderated by the size of the state. Thus, the larger and older a state, in addition to the more religious groups, the more the general violence. So this, in other words, this process becomes worse the larger the, the, the society. Rummel stresses that diversity is not as predictive of collective violence as lack of democracy. Now, that's important. You know, no one's, it's not being suggested here that Ethnic diversity is somehow some Rubicon, you know, it's a magical formula for understanding the world. Demo level of democracy predicts more, uh, uh, has greater predict predictable, is more predictive of level of violence than is ethnic diversity. But ethnic diversity is an important factor. But diversity alone accounts for 21% of the variance, Rummel found. 21%. Using another statistical approach, Rummel found that diversity explained 27% of the variance. As Rummel notes, quote, to be able to explain one-fifth of the variation among all states in such intense violence as guerrilla and civil wars from 1932 to 1982 is an accomplishment. And to do this with one, var with one variable, the number of ethnic groups, is even more important. And the factor analyses show clearly that this is a direct relationship after the effects of the correlation of other plural indicators and political, socio-economic and cultural indicators have been removed." End quote. So certainly, conflict is something, is one cost of, I mean, internal conflict, in other words, rising internal conflict could very well be a cost of avoiding external conflict. And I'll be coming to this soon. Do we have to choose? Do we have to choose? This is the question I'll be posing at the, uh, at the end. If homogeneous societies do not need laws, now, now this is a speculative point from, from Frank Solder. If homogeneous societies do not need laws repressing ethnic discrimination, well, obviously they wouldn't, would they? I mean, if you have one ethnic group in a society, how can you have ethnic conflict within a society? It makes sense, doesn't it? then their citizens can be, in principle, less subject to the state leviathan. In other words, the coercive state is less necessary to suppress internal ethnic conflict. If you don't have internal ethnic conflict, it makes sense. But ethnically diverse societies are more reliant on a strong 
a strong state for, for uh, peace and therefore prosperity. Nations, another advantage of national solidarity is that it protects you from, from external aggression by making the people more cohesive. And um, in the modern world, it, it, might, it could very well, this is a speculation again from Frank Solder, it could very well um, buffer the imbalances and excesses of globalization. I've just discussed that, haven't I? And finally, something I just want to touch on, one other advantage of ethnic homogeneity or relative homogeneity within a demarcated territory is ethnic continuity. And if Henry Harpending is right, and if Pierre Vandenberg's theory is right, and ethnic groups are huge extended families, then biologically speaking, it is important ethnic continuity, not necessarily expansion, but, but, but ethnic survival in the long term is far more important to any random individual's inclusive fitness than is the survival of, of the nuclear family. Now, taking Henry's um, maths and applying it to Cavalli Sports's uh, world data, world genetic assay data, the uh, national family can be anything from six to seven orders of magnitude larger than the nuclear family, than the inclusive fitness contained in the, in, the, in the nuclear family. So that, that, that would also be um, a plus of retaining, somehow retaining um, ethnic solidarity or homogeneity. So here's the problem. Now we're coming, coming to the problem. We first, we looked at some techniques, uh, some typical techniques that uh, advocated or used to, to prevent or moderate conflict between ethnic groups, especially between nation states. But then we see that there are numerous advantages in the solidarity and the, the, the organic unity that comes from such solidarity. And most of these techniques most of these techniques tend to undermine ethnic, ethnic uh, national solidarity. So the next heading is the double-edged sword of ethnic solidarity. The question is, what is a social planner to do? Social planners are practitioners. They, they're social technologists. They deploy, they invent or read about social technologies and they deploy them in their communities to have desired effects. What is a social planner to do? Runaway nationalism engenders warfare and ethnic conflict, we know that. Or at least it increases the risk, which is the same thing. <laughs> but failing to maintain the social cohesion that comes from ethnic homogeneity risks multiple economic and social values. How to preserve those values without destructive nationalism? That's the problem I'm, I'm setting. I, and again, I must say, I won't answer it. I'll just throw up some ideas. A part of the solution is a benevolent form of Hobbes Leviathan. A cross-cultural analysis by Easterly, who, by the way, Easterly, as you might recall, reported some of these data on the advantages of, of a relative ethnic homogeneity. So, but now we have a solution from, from Easterly. He's at the World Bank in New York. And he finds that the in a global uh, correlation study, he found that the economic costs of ethnic diversity are reduced by high quality institutions such as rule of law, efficient bureaucracy, freedom from government uh, theft, and government repudiation of contracts. That's a very uh, an optimistic point. Moreover, high quality government institutions reduce the risk of civil conflict. It's getting better all the time, including genocide. It is true it's true that for a, given, for a given level of institutional quality, ethnic diversity degrades economic growth. But there would seem to be hope in enlightened social engineering. The growth of the European Union, uh, for example, and other regional compacts, promises to banish uh, endemic warfare between the states that are involved in those regional compacts. One advantage... <coughs> now let me qualify easterly. One advantage of biologically minded social planners is that they are mindful of a broader range of interests than considered by economists. 
such as Easterly and sociologists. As evolved animals, humans have ultimate as well as proximate interests. Since um, an ethnic group is an extended family, and, and so now I bring again the point I, I just made, that if the ethnic group is a, a large extended family, then we have a huge interest in it, a genetic interest. And um, it's not good enough to simply, surely, to simply prevent conflict. There are other vital interests at stake than avoiding conflict. While institutional solutions to warfare can be envisaged along present trends, such as international law, trade, and regional security pacts, there will likely be a continuing role for the nation state. That's my idea, I'm just throwing that up. That's not a fact, that's just my idea. Whichever solutions are found, the analyses underpinning them will need to integrate findings from a range of disciplines, including the biology of social behavior. We live in an age of explosive growth in such knowledge as we've seen in, during the last week. Since the task of incorporating this knowledge into policy analysis has barely begun, because what I'm talking about is, is, is not generally done, it's not a recognised field of, field of study, much important work lies ahead. Thanks very much. <laughs> Discussions? Well, I certainly agree with practically all of your analysis. In fact, I recognize some of my own in it. Well, much. <laughs> <laughs> and I particularly like your way of visualizing the three dimensions of uh, affiliation, dominance, and uh, what's, how do you call it? Again? Affiliation, reciprocity, and dominance. Yeah, uh, which are essentially isomorphic uh, yeah. coercion, reciprocity, and nepotism. Uh, I like your way of. Uh, Putting institutions in, in a three dimensional context, uh, ascribing proportion to each of those three, three principles in various institutions. Uh, I'd just like to make uh, two addenda to, uh, to your comments. Uh, yes, I think one of the great pains of the uh, French Revolution in, in its aftermath in the late 18th and 12th, 19th century was the, the creation of the legitimation of the nation states, uh, trying to <coughs> Establishing uh, an isomorphism between state and nation, uh, and particularly the uh, uh, well, the misrepresentation that both states make of themselves as of being nation states, but in fact they're nothing of the sort. They're multinational states pretending to be nation states, so that the process of so-called nation building becomes, in fact, a process of nation killing. Uh, where the dominant group uh, tries to obliterate the other ethnic groups in the so-called nation state in order to become a closer approximation to a genuine nation state. So most of the, about roughly, if you take as a criterion states in which 90% of the population plus uh, speaks the same language, roughly 90% of the world's states are not nation states, they're multinational states uh, pretending to be nation states. So. Um, my formula there is what I call denationalizing the state, uh, and my preferred way of doing it would be to, to create subnational states. Uh, uh, so we would have once again uh, 30 or 40 or 50 Germanys and uh, an equal number of Frances, and uh, uh, I see nothing wrong with that. And I think, I think in fact, the Swiss Canton model is a very really good one. Uh, the Canton is, in fact, subnational. There are several. German-speaking cantons, several French-speaking cantons. Uh, uh, so the, the Swiss model of uh, federalism is in fact subnational and constitutes, I think, a very good model for uh, uh, for a relatively harmonious uh, political system at the subnational level. So the decoup decoupling state and nation by creating smaller states that are subnational. Uh, one other quick ad addendum is that one of, I think, the tension reducing, ethnic tension reducing mechanisms in the modern world is a massive phenomenon which is still comparatively understudied, uh, but most of my recent field work in the last ten, ten years I've been doing practically nothing but study tourism. Uh, tourism, I think, is one of the few good things that is happening in the world today. It's clearly the, the main form of intercultural contact in the world today. It's uh, outstandingly the least conflictual form of uh, uh, ethnic contact in the world today. 
And tourism is in the sense the best of both worlds. It establishes contacts across ethnic lines, and, but the tourist is, is transient, so he doesn't permanently invade the, the, uh, the other's territory, uh, and is therefore welcomed simply because he or she is transient. So the very transience of tourism uh, enable, uh, creates an ideal situation in which you have ethnic contact and prism we do would be better knowledge and understanding of one another uh, mm -hmm. without creating the competition for resources uh, uh, after a pleasant uh, one or two or three or four weeks uh, experience in the country you go back home thank you very much uh, see you later and everything is fine so I, I think tourism is an, an extremely interesting phenomenon it has a number of properties which make it extremely interesting in its own right uh, but it's also one of the most promising forms of, uh, of, of inter-ethnic contact and one of the, of the great potential <coughs> reducers uh, of ethnic tension in the of the world. Unfortunately, tourism is still very asymmetrical in, in terms of who can afford to be a tourist. Uh, uh, that, is, that is the downside of it, that it is so uh, socially and economically asymmetrical. Uh, but increasingly, I think we find cheaper forms of tourism, which involves wider and wider uh, sections of populations, uh, so that now, for example, certainly the elites of developing countries uh, <coughs> make a substantial contribution to the world tourism. So now we have substantial numbers of uh, uh, Indians, Chinese, and so on, people coming from relatively poor countries, uh, traveling internationally. Well, Yeah, thanks. Now, I, I'd, I'd add to the um, to a little bit of another point of, of optimism, which is that uh, the overwhelming majority of wars have been fought between neighbouring states, because that's given simple technology that the only one, only people one can reach to attack. Uh, there have been exceptions, like the Golden Horde went went across Eurasia. I, I know that, but essentially, it's been between neighbouring states. From a biological perspective. Um, um, from a genetic interest perspective, this is the least threatening sort of attack. If you see what I mean. If, 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 for example, one ignores all the other risks, subordination, plunder, and so on, and focuses on, on, on migration, or mass migration as a threat, um, then one can be fairly relaxed about being conquered by a neighbouring population, because the, the genetic difference is marginal. This is an optimistic point, and, and uh, it means that, for example, in the, in the, the, the Swiss Federation um, can be relaxed about internal migration, even though it's, it is territorially based in an informal way. Um, <laughs> it's, it, they, the, the Swiss can be relaxed about, about internal migration because they're, they're genetically very close. They're not serious genetic, genetic competitors. That would not be the case if Switzerland were made up of different racial groups, for example if those racial groups were reproducing at different rates. Now I'm coming to a, a problem that I, haven't, I don't have a solution for in the modern world, and that is uh, an answer to replacement migration. For me, as we do away with war, as we have more and more overarching international uh, bodies that, that, that prevent war, the remaining risk, biological risk, is replacement migration, which can have very large effects and is already beginning to have large effects on those societies which happen to be wealthy at the current time and so are attracting large, large levels of migration and at the same time which are uh, falling off in population numbers. And the question is you know, how, to, how to handle that in a civilised way, how to prevent replacement migration in, in a civilised way. Well, again, to be optimistic, um, because generally regional populations are close genetically, one can be relaxed. But it's the long-range migration that, that is a problem. So perhaps someone has a comment on that. <coughs> Any yeah, Bill. Frank, I have a rather general question, which is: you gave us a list of eleven benefits of national ethnic solidarity, and. It seems to me, as I, as I run my eyes down the list of the 11, that this is also correlated, these benefits are also correlated with economic development. That is, richer nations can afford to have less inequality, 
um, more per capita wealth, more foreign aid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if if that can be explained equally well by another variable like wealth, why resort to uh, explaining it in terms of because that? Because because, because wealth is not the cause. Wealth is the outcome of it. So well, so I'm higher. I'm not so sure about your causal relationship. Well, I'm just uh, reporting. Which causal error I'm just reporting the experts. I'm not an economist. This is what what the leading experts argue. That, that, so I have to. I, I can only appeal to to authority. I'm not an, not an economist. Well, but they report correlations, as I understand. And process. They have process models. So they look in, into what's happening in, in the societies, and they say, ah, we have a correlation. What's happening is when we look closely at the mechanisms, these diverse societies, m many of them, it's, a, it's not a deterministic thing, cannot get public goods going for example, in, in, in highly diverse societies. They cannot agree on public goods. So they have a process model as well. And the causal arrow is from diversity to low economic growth. It's not. It's, and also, the high foreign aid, for example, actually, this, that one can set that aside. That's just a, a cream on the cake of, of, of ethnic uh, solidarity. But um, that's controlling for, for wealth. So wealth is controlled for, and then, and then you still have the effect. So America, for example, is one of the most miserly givers of foreign aid in the world, and yet it's, uh, it's the wealthiest society in the world. That's a good point. I mean, okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I think you, you have a good point too. I think it, is, it may very well be in part a spurious correlation, and I think an acid test, for example, would be to take African countries, of which about half a dozen are in fact quite he ethnically homogeneous, Swaziland, Lesotho, uh, Botswana, uh, Somalia, <coughs> Somalia uh, you find about half a dozen African states uh, that have pretty, uh, that, that come close to being genuine nation states, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have, of the spectrum, you have the Nigeria, the so-called Democratic Republic of Congo, and so on, uh, and see if, the, if there isn't, if that correlation holds, uh, by continent, uh, I think you should do a continent by continent analysis uh, and see if you have. It works. It works within Africa. It works. Works within, within Africa. Africa. I mean, one can find exceptions. That's the nature of correlational correlational approach. One can find exceptions, but it works within Africa. It works globally. And Alicina, who leads in this field, he, he the title of his article was "Small is Beautiful," and um, he would, for example, look look at societies that broke up, and then track their economic growth afterwards and show that, that rapidly that, 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 that they took off, for example. So that you had more contribution to public goods feeding back into higher economic growth and then higher wealth. So it's not simply snapshot studies. These are process studies, to, not, not to the extent that we would like, but they have some, some interesting process elements to them when they get into the, to the details. And uh, there's, so many, you know, there's so many aspects to, these, to these, these benefits. Contribution to welfare, for example. Now that, it's not just simply a matter of wealth. Not simply, one cannot explain levels of wealth, welfare expenditure um, on wealth. For example, there are relatively poor European states um, that have generous welfare. Finland has always had, general, you know, since the welfare state was invented by Bismarck, um, it's always been relatively wealthy, but not as wealthy as the United States or England, which have dra dramatically weaker welfare regimes. It does look as though there's a, there, is a, a, there is an effect. But it's complex. Let me now argue against myself with, with some data. On this economic growth, the, the correlation between, the negative correlation between diversity and economic growth breaks down for 20 countries. Those are the 20 wealthiest countries in the world. I hate to be giving Bill some ammunition here. <laughs> the 20th wealthy, wealthiest countries in the world, all of which are Western, all of which have strong institutions, all of which have rule of law, prevent government theft, government reneging on contracts and so on, the, the relationship breaks down. But it works for the other 180 robustly and sometimes in a quite spectacular manner. I, I covered Easterly's explanation of that. If you can somehow get, get strong, uh, these strong um, uh, uh, in, institutions working, a lot of these invidious effects of diversity can be, can be neutralised or at least dampened. But, now, to come back to my own side again, and to, to defend against that, where do these institutions come from? They are all the product of relatively homogeneous, solitary, 
nation states. The American, in, in, the institutions of the, uh, created by the American Constitution was, were created by people, by a society that had slaves, true, but it was homogeneous to the extent of being Northwestern European Protestants. It was, it was, it was that. Um, the German welfare state was, was a product of a, okay, it was ethnically diverse, but they all spoke German and, and that was in a wave of, still in that uh, wave of nationalism following the Franco-Prussian War. So it was in the uh, 1880s that you had the, the welfare state coming into existence through Bismarck. And the French nation was, was a, a, a relatively homogeneous society. So all these, these institutions, including the welfare state and so on, were created by, by um, nations, by, by nation states, and, and now are still are carrying on. So the question, it might be, so this is the, the double-edged sword again, it, you know, I hate to be negative about this, but it might be a trade-off. We might have to sometimes choose the better of two evils. It might be that in order to get these robust institutions going, which then allow us to increase diversity without negative, negative effects, we have to start somehow with solidarity. It's a chicken and egg problem. First, we need solidarity to, 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 for people to invest in these uh, public goods, such as robust institutions, strong, efficient bureaucracy, so on, which then leads to a greater tolerance for diversity. It's a relatively un unstudied uh, question. Yeah. Bill. Um, this is a lot of this thinking is somewhat new to me. So my question would be done. Uh, how would you interpret the breakup of the former Yugoslavia in this term, in terms of this thinking? You've created smaller groups which are more ethnically homogeneous. Will they then be better off? Oh, so am I sage now? Wonderful. Uh, I like I mean, it. I like being sage. Assuming that the immediate effect of, of wars, because the populations are not nicely distributed, is done, and let's say if they reach a point where they really do have ethnically relatively homogeneous, several very small ethnically homogeneous states, will they then be better off in a higher investment in public? Okay, I'll make a prediction and then I'll discount it as worthless. My prediction is that exactly that will happen. That the um, I think the first state to break away was uh, 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 Slo uh, Slovenia. Slovenia. Then came Croatia. The problem is these countries were, in that order, the wealthiest. As you come from the Austrian-Italian direction down towards the southeast, um, it's a decreasing wealth. So the starting condition makes my prediction worthless. So all, all they have to do is stabilise themselves, stop the tremendous transfers of wealth that Tito was, was uh, drawing from those wealthy um, quarters down to the southeast, which was a major cause of, uh, of, uh, of unhappiness, by the way, of, of, of discontent, and, and was a cause of the breakup of, the, of, the, of Yugoslavia. That it was a, a, an, a welfare state on a massive scale where wealth was being siphoned. Um, but... Uh, to stick with my analysis, I would think that uh, uh, an important um, uh, precondition for curing, <coughs> curing the problems of the Balkans would be to give people a period of, of a nation state and then perhaps from that base go forward to further integration. Bosnia? No, by the way. Okay. Bosnia oh, was such a patch quilt, you know, to, I think that the, the population transfers and exchanges and, and so on would have to be coercive and I think the cost would outweigh the benefits. For Bosnia. Oh, well, Macedonia. I don't know that much about Yugoslavia. Macedonia, now, we're so outside it's my field of expertise, so it's, it's, it's coming to just uh, the opinions of Frank Salter. I'm not an expert in the area, but as I understand it, we have in Macedonia uh, uh, two, basically two nations. Yeah. There's a, such a large um, Albanian minority, very nationalist minded, with a, with a vision of a, of a greater Albania that is rapidly uh, outbreeding. The, uh, the, the, the Macedonians, that the problem is essentially unstable. And I might make a comment here that the solution that's been forced on the Macedonian proto-state by the United Nations and other Western powers, which is the, the American model, where you say, no, it must be a unitary state. And within that unitary state, one group is rapidly being outbred by the other group. It, stri it strikes me as unfair and, 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 uh, and catastrophic for the, for the Macedonians. So I would, I would suggest Yes, keep the state, 
but have, have the Swiss model for a while until it stabilizes, see how things are going. Um, so that the... <coughs> um, one great thing about having demarcated territories where groups belong to their own territories is that they're buffered. They're buffered against uh, differential birth rates. You see? So, so um, if the ethnic Albanians choose to have an average of five or six children per family, that's their business, and they'll have to deal with the overpopulation and, and building the infrastructure. That's their problem. But it's not a problem with, for, the, for the Macedonians if they, can, if they can maintain strong borders. Strong border, borders make good neighbours. Okay, yeah. When the people are dispersed on the ground, it's sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in the Bosnian situation, I, I, would, I would not, not recommend that. Ah, Teddy. In one of your answers, you came very close to my question. What is the role of bureaucracy in national society? You know, those most prosperous nations suffer from lots of bureaucracy. So what is the role? Positive, negative? Mm -hmm. Bureaucracy. Well, I think bureaucracy is absolutely using bureaucracy in the technical sense, not in the sense that Siegfried Fry and I would, would agree on using the term as a swear word, a four-letter word, a very long four-letter word, but using it technically as efficient administration. Absolutely necessary, absolutely. I mean, one, uh, there are lots of details I didn't discuss. One underpinning on the modern um, um, cohesive nation is mass education administered by an education bureaucracy where children are uh, given similar um, group memories, they're trained um, in, the, in national rituals and so on and, and, and so forth. Even the language is standardised. If you look at the, the, the nation building in Germany, standardisation of language was a major under undertaking. Um, a, a central German dialect was chosen to be Hochdeutsch, Germans will talk about it as being, oh, it's pure. It's not pure, it's just a local dialect that was imposed on the rest of the, the, rest of the country. But that was, that was beneficial from the point of view of, of, of creating a unified administrative class and, um, and business people who could then be mobile across Germany and so on. So I hate to say it, but I think bureaucracy absolutely is necessary for national unity. Yes? Uh, yes. Yeah. To, to the query. Uh, Just extrapolating from my experiences, in, uh, I was in Russia twice. The first time was exactly 10 years ago, six months after the demise of the Soviet Union, and I saw the wounds of an empire. Uh, today I see a thriving new nation. I think Russia is far better off without its empire uh, than it was with it, and now all it needs to do is get rid of Chechnya. You, you really need business. <laughs> Any other questions? The uh, most disturbing conflicts that we see today seem to be based on religious diversity mm. uh, rather than pure ethnic diversity. <coughs> I'm thinking, for example, of uh, India and Pakistan, but, but beyond that, the, the rising Muslim anger across <coughs> the world against uh, Christian nations <coughs> in the West. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between ethnic diversity and uh, religious diversity. As a, especially as a cause of ethnic conflict in, in, in that context, yeah. I, I think that uh, the religious dimension is the least satisfactorily explained. I, I'm unhappy with current theory of current um, evolutionary theories of religion. I know there's work coming out. We had a, a talk this week uh, by Bill. Uh, a new book has come out recently by David Sloan Wilson, Darwin's Cathedral. I haven't read it yet, but I've read the uh, Precy, I've read the abstracts. And I know I know his ideas in general, and but I, I'm his argument is that it's a group strategy, it's a it's a cultural group strategy, uh, and, uh, a religion, which would help explain ethnic conflict, I suppose, especially with the the intolerant uh, monotheistic religions. But uh, I'm I'm unhappy to give a simple answer. I don't think that Shaw and Wong, in their 1989 book included religion as a fictive kinship marker. 
this is an attempt. This is them trying, they're struggling with how do we... They know religion's important. People keep talking about religion when they fly aeroplanes into tall buildings and when they blow themselves up and when they take other people's land. They, they, we can't ignore it. People talk about it as they do these things. But I'm not, um, I'm not happy with the, satis- with the explanations that, 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 that we have. The, best, the most promising line of research, in my view, is religion as a group strategy along the, the um, Boyd and Richardson and Sloan Wilson, uh, David Sloan Wilson approach. Yes, Bill. <coughs> it fits in your scheme under if you had a concept, you know, all Frenchmen are committed to democracy and that sort of yeah, thing. The concept is there. Mm. As an example, that's a thing you can be committed to. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's, a good, that's not something you can investigate. Does that really work to create cooperation, a shared commitment? But um, it logically could be the beginning of an ethnic group, that if you define a religious group, make it endogamous and interbreed for several generations, then you have what you think of an ethnic group. Um, groups like the Hutterites, I suppose, some of those groups would be examples. That is, initially, there were more from groups that I assume were not uh, historically endogamous. Mm. But then they become endogamous for several generations, and then they take on the character of people in ethnic group. I think, they're a small... I think that is an aspect, and it does, in fact, happen. So, you know, I'm, I'm now with some students. Um, we're looking at different group strategies in Europe. The Ostdeutsch, this huge German diaspora that went from Romania in the south up to the Volga and has largely disappeared now. But, but this had some, uh, some uh, group strategies about it and it had a religious dimension. For example, they would find themselves Protestants or Catholics in an Orthodox environment, for example. The, and the Mormons might be another. The, the Mormons, Mormons are another, but the Hutterites. They clearly were uh, pulled from a diverse population. They yeah. weren't terribly closely related among the uh, Anglo Saxon Americans of North America. But then once well, given, they became a cohesive group, group and endogamous, they became more interrelated. Yeah, so and, but, and, and, when it, and when it first begins, clearly it's not an ethnic group by descent, mm-hmm. but it can, can become one. Yeah, and they still don't think of themselves as an ethnic group. They work very hard to bring in outsiders through proselyte. Mm. But I think if you look at the Mormons, you find they do have a lot of commitment to public goods, not government ones, but their own version of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. All right. Now, these are all niche religions, you know, sort of niche religions. Now let's look at the major ones, which are dominate about 90% of the world's population. The, the religion gets too big, you can't really do it. Yeah. Well, just I just want to make two comments. <laughs> yeah. One is that I, I like the idea of, of uh, I like the meme idea in that sense. These are proselytizing religions where, where what is being put together is a, a brilliant social technology that is catchy. And, uh, you know, if you, you want to have 50 virgins, or if you want to, when you die, or if you want to go to heaven when you die, hey, who wants to die? You know, so it's very catchy, and, it's, uh, and it has a number of aspects to it which, which gives comfort. And Christianity and Islam and Buddhism have spread across diverse, diverse ethnic, uh, range of ethnic groups. So clearly it's not an endogamous well, strategy. It would be very hard to think of all the Christians in the world as an ethnic group that are interbred. Yeah. Just well, that's the second point I was just I was just coming to. The Mormons, if they were terribly successful, might eventually fall apart because they became too big. Yeah. But one of the things that prevents that is uh, very costly um, requirements for membership. You have to tie ten percent of your income, yeah. and things of that sort. And uh, while they do a lot of proselytizing, I suspect they don't have a lot of success in bringing people like me to give them ten percent of their income and do all these other things. I don't think they're going to destroy themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, my version of that is that when the when the these proselytizing religions uh, became very large, uh, they fell apart. One could say they were no longer a, a group strategy, but um, they were in fact used for extensive periods as group strategies. Just think of Christendom against Islam. Christendom was a mobilizing force against the Turks, for example, the Turkish invasion. Uh, it's it's the the idea of Christendom against them that helped mobilise um, uh, Christian Europe to to push the um, the Muslims out of 
Spain, for example. But that doesn't mean that it is perpetually a group strategy. It, it just is another asset that, that can be used. Well, most of these world religions, once they become large, break down into small sects. Mm. And that's one way to do it. You, if, if the Mormons were to become very large, they could break into two sects on some theological grounds. They could decide that some people, each could decide the other group was impure. And then they'd have smaller groups that would be make sense Agreed. in terms of the uh, ethnic model that you're using. Right? So that would recommend fission. Once you become too large, you fission. Mm. And they do tend to do that. Mm. Um, I, I just mentioned very briefly, too, that the, the, the Hutterites, um, I believe their birth rate is, is going down, but for a period of time, the average Hutterite woman was having 10 children, mm -hmm. which would mean 100 grandchildren, 1,000 great-grandchildren. Um, and uh, Richard Sosa's wrote an article entitled why are we not all Hutterites? And my reaction to the article was if things continue the way they are, we will be. They are definitely all breeding everybody else. <laughs> and not the fight for the woman. The good Hutterite for things. Yeah, if that were to continue, which I seriously doubt, but it wouldn't take all that long to fill the world up with Hutterites. <laughs> I'm doing my best to counteract there. The good trend. Any other questions? Time for a break? Great. Thanks very much for your attention.